I started this series about how to grow in your relationship with God, and uh, I made quite a mess of it early on because I, I'd start on a topic, and then I would just go on it, and then, you know, um, I never finished any of the first four messages. And so each, each message kind of turned into a series. And, and I, you know, I was thinking about it, and I think, well, that's because that's kind of it. This is kind of everything. Like, if you figure out... Um, about growing your relationship with God, that's pretty much everything else is details. And so everything stems from that divine connection. It all flows from there. And so um, in this series, I'm helping us grow in our relationship with God. I've tried to explore some of the traditional things and I've also tried to explore some of the less traditional things. Um, traditional things like, you know, a couple weeks ago, I, I've talked about the scriptures and how, how important it is that you start to internalize and digest them and how to read them. And, and I even didn't, after two weeks, I didn't even finish that. And I, I, by the way, I put a message out on YouTube about how to read the Bible, just like basics, because a lot of people are just starting. So if you're just starting, you can find that on our YouTube channel, just how do I even begin? Fair question. If you've never, if you never began, you, know, you got to know how to start. And so we put that out there. Um, and then I've been exploring some less traditional. And I think next week I'm going to do that for Palm Sunday. To, and then we'll kind of wrap at Easter. But today I want to explore a couple that are quite traditional. In some ways about as old school as you get. Like growing your relationship with God by, ready? I said it's going to be old school, right? Going to church. And now you say, well, Chris, you don't need to do it because we're here. And, and I get that. So this might be like for someone else, you know, or this might be something you pass on. Or, um, or it might be that, that reminder that we need. But I, I hope I don't, in, don't deliver it in such the old school way. That is, you know, I want you to go to church because if you don't, God's mad at you or some version of that. I really don't think that has anything to do with it. But I do think something about gathering together with brothers and sisters with the same intention can grab a hold of us in a way that other things just can't. And um, we need that. We need it. it. Life gets going. Things start happening. You hear noises. You hear, I mean, is anybody like me? Like, I got a new laptop a while ago, and I hate this thing. <laughs> but you know why I hate it is because it's all pre-programmed with all of these advertisements to take me all of these places, I have to figure out how to shut it down. It's just like, let me pick what I want to look at. And I also say, and I'm not disciplined enough to not look at the stuff you're showing me. <laughs> you with me? Like, try looking up golf clubs one time on the... Next time you open your computer, everything's... And so my point is this, there's all of these things calling at us. Anybody ever have to slap yourself and go, stop running down that hole and get back. So if nothing else, I would hope in a modern day context today, coming to church should give us a good hard reset. What matters? What doesn't matter? What's important? What's not important? What do I value? What don't I value? In a world that's clamoring at us all the time, that would be one of my hopes. Also at the beginning of the series, I was talking about growing in your relationship with God. And since we're coming to an end of the series, I wanted to just revisit because what I mean by growing is that our relationship with God does change over time. And that's the, okay, that's a good thing. Just as your relationship with your parents changed over time. They went from, 
caring for you and your utter dependence on them for every single thing that you needed to them caring for you and giving you a little bit of independence to then all of a sudden you get a lot of independence and then some of us are at a stage of life where now you're starting to care for your parents, right? But the relationship changes. And as we grow in our understanding and our our relationship with God changes and I think it becomes more intimate. Jesus said it this way, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Or Moses went from this thunderous relationship to God to it says, Moses would speak to God face to face as a man speaks with his friend. If I had the time and we had a lot more weeks, I could teach you a couple more things. And if you were ready. Don't take this the wrong way. Most of you aren't. Are you mad? Is anybody watch The Chosen? Like I know half the ladies are watching because you're doing your Bible study and all that. But, but the one thing about the chosen is the disciples, they didn't get much, did they? I mean, maybe, like you, you read about the disciples, you hear about them, you think, well, these guys, man, these guys are amazing. They were pretty much clueless most of the time. Up to the very end, Jesus is trying to get them there. But, they're, but Paul, and, and Jesus would say this, he says, I have so much more to tell you, but you're not yet ready. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things I got to teach Charlie, but I'm not going to tell her when she's five. I got a lot to teach her. But she's not ready. Wouldn't, wouldn't be good. Maybe we'll do a class, a 2.0 or a later class for those that are ready. But Paul said a couple of things. He goes, I no longer live. Christ lives in me. What does that mean? He goes from this thunderous God to this intimate face-to-face friendship to somehow... Oneness. Or in John 17, Jesus said, I and you and you and me. It's like all the lines start to get blurred. Oh, we're not ready for that. No, no, not today. Okay. But you will go this. <clears throat> it gets more intimate. The more you get to know God, it gets more intimate. And we know when you're close with somebody, when you're really close with somebody, less of the formalities are needed. Does that make sense? Uh, you can cut to, in fact, sometimes you don't have to say anything. I, I know what you're thinking, dear. You don't have to say it. That you, some people say it's like you become one mind. It's possible you can get really, 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 really close to God. More than most people ever dreamed of this distant, thunderous relationship where you're just trying to make sure your ledger's good enough and I got enough good or I've said enough right prayers to overcome my screw-ups. Please, let's discard with that early on. But as you grow, you start to find that God's this, this whisper away. It says he's not far from any of us. In fact, in him, Paul said, we live and move and have our being. We're nearing mystery now. And that's the direction you you need to move. Um, Charlie said to me the other day, Daddy, uh, me and Orohi were talking at school the other day. That's her friend from school. And uh, uh, Orohi is taller than I am, but I am older than she is. We talked about that, Dad. I said, oh, good. She said, yeah, we talked about it for a while at school, me and Arohi, that I'm older, but she's taller, and that she's taller and I'm older. We talked about that, Dad. I said, oh, that's good, sweetie. It's good. Yeah, that's what we talked about, what she's trying to do, trying to process something that doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense. Like, you're older, you're taller. But they had somehow figured out the ages and the birthdays, and Charlie's on the, you know, Less tall percentile as you go to the doctor, right? And I don't know what percentile this girl's on, but uh, they're not that far apart. But they figured it out, and it's a mystery. But you know, when you're when you're simple, when you're when you're a child, it's just well. When you're young, you're this tall. When you're older, you're this tall. Like when you get a fifth birthday, you should just go "Er," and be taller than all the four-year-olds. And that's not how life works exactly. And it's just the very beginning of trying to explain to a child that 
There's a lot more to this than you yet understand. And maybe for this, this is for some who've just taken the God thing and just thrown it all overboard because the only version of God they got was this, this thunder thrower in the sky and, and uh, you know, just, just waiting for you to screw up. And so, you know, he could put it on his list and, not, and, not, and then you move away from that and you move to this intimacy of friendship. But man, Jesus took it, took it a level that I don't think people even read. I'm in you and you're in me. In him we live and move and have our being. It's possible to be completely intimate with God. And, and dare I say, the way you pray, how you pray, what, all that, at some point it doesn't seem to matter as much. You don't think God's calculating your words because of course he's not. I mean, I try to teach Charlie to speak, you know, English as correctly as I can, born and raised in Flint, give me a little grace, uh, as correctly as I can, not because I need it for me because I kind of know what she's saying most of the time. Anybody with me? I kind of get it, but just so she can communicate with y'all. <laughs> Southern Flint is where I grew up. <laughs> you, you will connect with God. God will meet you. You'll have this intimate relation, which is why your relationship with God is going to be different than mine. Just like my brother's relationship to my dad was different than mine. Is it true? But the goal, the goal is so that your relationship with God is just purely connected. I've been using this throughout, but it's like there's these airwaves and it's like you gotta be able to tune in. And once you get tuned in, then the connection flows. And you know, look, look, you know when you're being connected and you know when the connection's fuzzy. And I'll just say this one more time. How do I say this the right way? It's not because God moved. What, what we like to do is we like to blame people or we like to say, well, if you did something wrong, then God kind of blocked the connection. I think the connection, the airwave is always there, but sometimes we're ready to tune in and sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're listening and sometimes we're not. And, and I'll say it this way. Sometimes we're focused and sometimes we're not. Back to church. Why in the world do we go to church? If God, I mean, some of you, as soon as, you've, as soon as you heard me say, God's not taking attendance, I mean, three people just left. I saw them. Like, oh, I, I didn't know. So, you, if God's not taking attendance, then we're doing it for some benefit that it, it, it has for us. And I think if there's any benefit, it's that what we need is something that brings us into focus. Let me read a slice to you from Acts chapter 2. This was the early, the earliest church. Um, I was talking about this with a friend the other day. And I really, I really think there's a lot of truth to this. The earliest followers of Jesus... You have Jesus, and you have the resurrection, and then you have these early followers. I mean, they were following Jesus, and then all of a sudden he wasn't gone, but they were still following, and they were following the things that he said. So they went from following him around, walking around behind him, to then him being gone, but then what they would do is they, they would remember the things that he taught them. So it was all about that, the following of Jesus. And what they would do is they would gather together, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Who were the apostles? The apostles were the disciples. They were the ones that followed Jesus around. And they would relay the things that he said. They would say, well, he would used to say things like this. 
You know, you've heard it said, you know, to uh, hate your enemy. I tell you, love your enemy. And then they would talk about it. Well, how are we supposed to do that? He would say, don't worry. Jesus taught us not to worry. And so on and on, they would teach. And then it says, to the fellowship. That is, they were somehow committed to each other. To the breaking of bread. So they would get together for a meal. We're going to have one um, next Thursday. Something about a meal... I'll tell you something that's missing in the modern day church in general. Maybe not so much Orchard Grove, perhaps a little bit, but you you come, you sit, you observe or listen or sing along or do whatever, you take notes maybe, and then you 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 leave, at least potentially. And that's not how they that's not how they get there. There was always food involved. Like they were gonna pancakes together. So there you go. Stay for pancakes. There's my Bible verse. All right. But it's more than if we're going to, you know, raise money for the youth ministry or it, it's the fellowship. It's the breaking of bread. And as you know, when you do that with somebody, <clears throat> your relationship fundamentally changes. I, let's just, you work with somebody at the office and you go by, hey, how you, hey, Bob, how are the kids? Hey, good. And you've been doing that for 20 years. And one day Bob goes, you know, hey, Let's go grab coffee. What did I do, Bob? What do you want from me? You know, or maybe you're like, yeah, we, we should, we should do that. But whatever happens, fundamentally, if you guys do something besides pass each other in the office and exchange pleasantries and you sit down and you have coffee together, your relationship fundamentally changed forever. Because now I have a, the, the ability to focus on you and what's going on in your life and in your world and see you as a person with problems and children and hopes and dreams. Is this true? And this is how the early church functioned. So in some way, they were opening their lives to each other. And let me just say this. The best thing that you can do for yourself to get some more out of church, the best thing you can do for yourself to get some more out of it is to get involved at one deeper level. This is what I always tell people. If you're looking, Sunday and something else. Just do something else. I mean, I, I was up here giving announcements for like 20 minutes. We got this, we got this, we got this, we got this, we got this. Just do something else. One thing, go to the daddy-daughter dance and meet another dad. Go to the men's study and meet another guy. Go to the women's study and Wednesday. Go somewhere and do something. Get in a small group. Because if you get in that group and you start to exchange your life with somebody, it's fundamentally different than observing and leaving, observing and leaving. Because that's not how they did it. And what I was saying with my friend is that the early church was different than the church has been over 2,000 years. I mean, truthfully, the church has been sometimes not always very nice. I'll be kind if you know history at all. And that doesn't, that doesn't discount the good that is there, no doubt about it. But part of my ambition 25 years ago and what we'll be talking about in the series that we're going to do is, look, this is what we dream of. People breaking bread, these small groups. And people will tell you, man, you get involved in that. <clears throat> it's a game changer. I know some friends that have been here for most of the 25, and they will tell you, I mean, they are bored with me. Trust me, they just, Chris, I've already heard that story four times, you know. But they're still here. But the reason that they're here is because they're connected. They know people. People know them. And they're sharing their lives with one another. And then it goes on to say, they sold their possessions and goods and gave to anyone as he had need. Now let's just be honest. You don't do that if you don't know somebody. You know, you just don't. But if you know somebody, and you really know them, and man, this person's not gonna make it through. And all of a sudden you realize, well, I got some, something extra over here, I could sell this, and then I, they could get that. And all of a sudden you had this family forming. 
Every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes. Something about this, this gathering, the privilege of 25 years, so many different people here, I got to go to their home and break bread with them and cry with them and laugh with them and pray with them and, and you know, help to you know, bury their loved ones and the highs and the lows. And I'm just telling you, if, if church for you has only been a get credit with God and get out, you've completely missed what it's all about. Completely. And I, I get it. Some of you were sold that. Like, <laughs> I was talking with a friend the other day and we were talking about, you know, he grew up in a certain denomination, we'll call it. And they don't think of themselves as a denomination. They think of themselves as it. But anyway, a certain type of church where, where um, you know, you had to get credit. It was about getting credit. You know what I mean? And so like you'd sneak in there and get the bulletin and then go home and, sh and hide it somewhere so you could show mom and dad that you had been. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? A couple of you do. A couple of you did that. And, and boy, to think like, that kind of says it all. In a way, it says it all. It's like, it's somehow to like make God happy or get a credit checked off and then, but there's no, there's no life for you in it. And I'm telling you, nothing could be further from the truth because if you got involved in this little circle, this little fellowship, this was life changing. We've sort of, Here's what we did. We, we've politely forgotten about God. We're very polite about it. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy. This is a good one. Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8. Be careful. Kind of a theme, if you've ever read the book of Deuteronomy, is be careful, remember, and don't forget. I've, I've said for a long time, I've, like, Deuteronomy to me is like, the, is like a, the speech you give to your kids when you drop them off at college. These, these phrases, be careful, remember, remember all the things I told you, remember, 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 and don't forget, don't forget to call mom, don't forget, don't forget. Deuteronomy is sort of a recap of what happened earlier, and it's like this long speech given by Moses to the people as they're about to enter the promised land, for a little context, for people newer to the Bible. You're about to enter the promised land, and so you're going to, these phrases, remember, I'm about to give you something. If you know the whole story, Moses doesn't go into the promised land, right? He's going to set the, he's going to give them, the, they're, they're going to step in. Remember, don't forget, be careful. Remember how the Lord led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you. Did you know this? There's a scripture that says it takes about two weeks to get from Egypt to the promised land. Two weeks. Turn into 40 years. To humble you and to what? Test you. Does anybody like me feel like that's kind of pretty much what my life has been? It's to humble you and to test you. Let me see where you're at with this. I mean, in a way, that's, I don't mean humble and humiliate. I mean, keep you grounded. Like if you're about to hand your, the, the, the kid the, in the house the keys to the car, how many know like a little humility is good? A little awareness, like be humble, to test you. Are you, are you any, can you handle this? God's about to send them into the promised land and he's going to he's gonna have to humble them. He's going he's gonna to have to test them. He's going to have to make sure that they're grounded. He says this, all those years your clothes didn't wear out, your feet didn't swell. Somehow God got you here. Hey, everybody, look here. That's one thing you can say. You know what? Somehow God got me here. 
Somehow God's gotten, and God's been good. He says, though, when you get there, be careful because um, when you settle down, I like this, when you're satisfied, when you build fine houses and your herds are large, your flocks are growing, there's silver and gold piling up. In other words, kind of when you made it, <laughs> then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. How do we forget God? We do it so politely. That's the key. I'm going to teach you how to forget God. Ready? Be very polite about it. Right? That's what people do. You know, you don't just dismiss God. Ah, that's what's not. What happens is we just get a little busy. You know, we're counting our money and our gold and we're doing things. And, you know, and, we're, and, then, and then God's like, yeah, yeah, well, we got we to get back there. Now, trust me, when you hit bottom, when it's the other direction, it's funny. Who remembers 9-11? I'll tell you what I remember, 9-12. Because the churches were packed. Hmm. <laughs> you know, we were in a movie theater. We had a flood. I don't know if some of you know this story. We had a flood. <laughs> we had a flood the night of 9-11. A flood. Came in the movie theater during the night, September the 10th, overnight, you know, someone calls me from the office. I go, you won't believe this. And I'm watching my TV at home. I, I said, I don't believe it. And they go, what? And I go, what? He said, there's four feet of water in the movie theater. It was a sloped theater, ran down. I go, what? And how many remember, like, nobody knew what was going on. Like, what's going on? I, I connected them. I grab the TV, I throw it in the car, right? I go driving up there, and sure enough, a water main had broke and had come into the theater the whole night. We couldn't even meet inside. We were out in the parking lot, and the president called for a day of prayer the next day. I remember this. Parking lot's full. When we get fat, we tend to what? Forget who brought us here. What's this saying? Dance with the one that brung you. You can think about that for a couple of weeks. If God brings you here, he says, otherwise you will say this to yourself. Everybody should go home, find your Bible, go home and read Deuteronomy chapter 8. But when you do circle verse 17, it says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. I did this. Be careful. Be careful. I did this. It's funny because in a way you did. I mean, you got up. Good for you. You went to work. Good for you. You put your hand to the plow. Good for you. You did the math. Good for all. Oh, good, good, good job. But the deeper question is, who gave you the hands? Who gave you the brains? Who gave you the lungs? Who gave you the breath? To humble us and to test us, to remind us, don't forget God. Can I say it as simply as possible? I mean, going to church, if it's nothing else, is to help you to remember. Don't forget God. Don't forget God. Don't forget the one who brought you here. I mean, we were all, uh, I, I dare to say, I, maybe you weren't, but I think we were all spoiled kids at one point in our life where we went through a phase we just had no clue what our parents did for us. Anybody? Through a clue, I have no clue what my mom did for me, sacrificed for me. Worked two jobs. My mom used to come home, she'd work one job and then she'd go work another job, waitressing, and she'd come home and dump all the change on the table. And we'd say, Mom, go back to the job where you make the money. 
Because we like to see the change come out on the table. And then you go through my arrogant teenage years and I don't call her, I don't thank her, I don't remember her. Shameful. We don't look back, shameful. But don't forget God. He brought you here. He brought you here. Remember. Don't forget. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. That's worth thinking about. Amidst all the other things that you think about, it's worth thinking about who's the one that gives you the ability to do anything. Just get on the other side of the coin. When the lungs stop working, when the liver stops functioning, when this isn't going, all of a sudden... All that stuff that we took for granted starts to become so important. If nothing else, church should be the time you bow your head or your knee or something. Something bows down and says, it's bigger than me. It's bigger than me. Thank you, God. If that's all you can utter, just bow your head and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. This is not about me. This is not my story. This is your grace coming to me and living in me and through me. God, we need more people to go to church. <laughs> Come all the way back to old school. But we do. Because we've got to get reminded. just got to get reminded because we're all human and we too easily forget after, like I said after a while like, you'll be here for a few years and you're like he ain't told me anything new and I'm like I know but what I learned over the years is I, it's not really about me teaching you a lot of new things it's about me trying to just keep reminding you of the same old things that you always knew somewhere down in here